Hello, Namaskar. Students, today we'll be moving to our English lecture, International Relations as an Academic Subject. It is very necessary for us to understand what is the breadth, width, and the depth of international relations as an academic subject. Now, let us see the, what is a traditional core of international relations has to do with issues concerning the development and change of sovereign nation statehood in the context of the larger system or society of states. Focus on states and their relations of states help us to explain why war and peace is a central problem of traditional IR theory. Contemporary IR is concerned not only with political relations between states, but also with a host of other subjects, economic interdependence, human rights, humanitarian intervention, human security, transnational cooperation, international organizations, the environment, gender inequalities, economic development, terrorism, area studies, and so on. For what are the four main? Now let us move into the uh, how the discipline has been organized. What are the its theoretical foundations? The four major classical theories are realism, liberalism, international society and international political economy. This, then we move on to what is called the period of the 1950s and 1960s till the 80s when you had the scientific approaches. We did speak about behavioralism, about David Easton, Kenneth Boulding, Martin Kaplan and others who greatly influenced uh, international relations and further widened its multidisciplinarity and interest. So here we will be doing systems theory, decision making, functionalism and neo-functionalism, geopolitical theories and environmental theories, microcosmic theories of violent conflict, macrocosmic theories of violent conflict, that is international war, Theories of deterrence, game theories, these are the schools that we will be doing under scientific approaches to international relations. And then what are the alternative approaches? The alternative approaches, please understand, realism and uh, what to say, liberalism, as well as Marxism, and as well as what to say, um, international political economic theories have what is called the new schools. We will also have to do those new schools. With that, we have social constructivism, post positivism, foreign policy, feminism, post colonial and decolonial theories, post structuralism, and international ethics. So, this is the wide gambit where a lot of work has been taking place in international relations. Now let us look at the historical context of the development and change of sovereign statehood. Theoretical discussion between IR scholars is the major debates. Other disciplines, especially philosophy, history, economics, law, these new sites and new methods influence international relations, a constantly dynamic and a growing discipline. Now, what is the evolution? There are three major debates since IR became an academic subject. And um, I told most of you that in the 1920s, this became an academic subject. And there are, what to say, four major uh, uh, what to say, stages in which IR theory has developed. The first major debate is between realism and liberalism. The second debate between traditional approaches and the scientific approaches or what we call the behavioral school. The third between neoliberalism, neorealism and neo-Marxism. The emerging fourth debate is between established traditions and post-positivist 
alternatives, which still is the current contemporary debates in which the third and the fourth, there is still a lot of work going on in these areas. Now, what is theory? It is necessary to be familiar with theory because facts do not speak for themselves. Facts alone cannot answer these questions. We need help from theories. They tell us which facts are important and which are unimportant. That is, they structure our view of the world. They are based on certain values and often they also contain visions of how we want the world to be. What we discussed in the previous topic of what is and what ought to be. The next is an idea or a, what is theory? An idea or set of ideas that is intended to explain facts or events. An idea that is suggested or presented as possibly true but that is not known or proven to be true. The general principles or ideas that relate to a particular subject. See, theories are formulated to explain, predict and understand phenomena. And in many cases to challenge and extend existing knowledge within the limits of critical bounding assumptions. The theoretical framework is a structure that can hold or support a theory of a research study. Theories guide the enterprise of finding facts rather than of reaching goals and are neutral concerning alternatives among values. A theory can be a body of knowledge which may or may not be associated with particular explanatory models. To theorize is to develop this body of knowledge. Scientific theories are distinguished from hypotheses, which are individual empirical testable conjectures and the scientific laws which are descriptive accounts of the way nature behaves under certain conditions. In the book From Religion to Philosophy, Francis Confort suggests that the orifics used to the word theoria to mean passionate sympathetic contemplation. Pythagoras changed the word to mean a passionate sympathetic contemplation of mathematical knowledge because he considered this intellectual pursuit the way to reach the highest plane of existence. Pythagoras emphasized subduing emotions and bodily desires to help the intellect function at the higher plane of theory. Thus it was Pythagoras who gave the word theory, the specific meaning that led to the classical and modern concept of a distinction between theory as uninvolved neutral thinking and practice. Aristotle, the father of political science, his terminology already measured contrast theory with praxis or practice and this contrast exists till today. For Aristotle, both practice and theory involve thinking, but the aims are different. Theoretical contemplation considers things humans do not move or change, such as nature. So it has no human aim apart from itself and the knowledge it helps to create. On the other hand, praxis or practice involves thinking, but always with an aim to desired actions, wherein, whereby humans cause change or movement themselves for their own ends. Any human movement that involves no conscious choice and thinking could not be an example of praxis or doing. Aristotle, the Greek philosopher, the polymath during the classical period in ancient Greece, taught by Plato, he was the founder of the Lyceum, the peripatetic path, path, school of philosophy and Aristotelian tradition. His writings cover many subjects including physics, biology, zoology, metaphysics, logic, ethics, aesthetics, poetry, theater, music, rhetoric, psychology, linguistics, economics, politics and government. 
Aristotle provided a complex synthesis of the various philosophies existing prior to him. It was about all from his teachings that the West inherited it, its intellectual lexicon, as well as problems and methods of inquiry. As a result, his philosophy has exerted a unique influence on almost every form of knowledge in the West, and it continues to be a subject of contemporary philosophical discussion. Now, what are the characteristics of theory? Theories are analytical tools for understanding, explaining, and making predictions about a given subject matter. There are theories in many and varied fields of study. A formal theory is a syntactic in nature and is, is only meaningful when there is a semantic com uh, component by applying it to some content. Four, theories in various fields of study are expressed in natural language, but always constructed in such a way that their general form is identical to a theory as it is expressed in formal language of mathematical logic. Theories may be expressed mathematically, symbolically, or in common language, but are generally expected to follow principles of rational thought or logic. The logical positivist thought of scientific theories and deductive theories, that a theory's content is based on some form of system of logic and on basic axioms. In a deductive theory, any sentence which is logical consequence of one or more of the axioms is also a sentence of that theory. This is called the received view of theories. In the semantic view of theories, which has largely replaced the received view, theories are viewed as scientific models. A model is a logical framework intended to represent reality. Similar to the way that a map is a graphical model that represents the territory of a city or a country. In this approach, theories are, are a specific category of models that will fulfill, fulfill the necessary criteria. Now we go into important theoreticians, especially who helped us. The first name that comes to us is Thomas Kuhn. The Structure of Scientific Revolutions. This was a book that uh, Professor Satish Kumar, who was my teacher in Jawaharlal Nehru University, JNU, wanted us all to read. And it was there that I got introduced to Thomas Kuhn. See, Thomas Kuhn basically brings in a concept that we use now very commonly in international relations theory. And that is the concept of paradigm shift. Fundamental theme of Kuhn's argument is that there is the typical developmental pattern of a mature science is the successive transition from one paradigm to another through a process of revolution. When a paradigm shift takes place, a scientist's world is qualitatively transformed and quantitatively enriched by fundamental novelties of either fact or theory. New paradigms always provide an improvement, not just a different explanation. A new paradigm completely expunges the old previous paradigm. Philosophy of science. The central idea of this extraordinarily influential and controversial book is that the development of science is driven in normal periods by science, by adherence to what Kuhn called a paradigm. The functions of a paradigm are to supply puzzles to scientists to solve and, uh, and to provide the tools for their solution. Kuhn's central claim is that a careful study of the history of science reveals that a development in any scientific field happens via a series of phases. A paradigm shift, a concept identified by the American physicist and philosopher Thomas Kuhn, 
is a fundamental change in the basic concepts and experimental practices of a scientific discipline. Kuhn presented his notion of a paradigm shift in his influential book, The Structure of Scientific Revolutions. Paradigm. In science and philosophy, a paradigm is a distinct set of concepts or thought forms, including theories, research methods, postulates, and standards for what constitutes legitimate contributions to a field. Social theory can usefully be conceived in terms of four key paradigms. Functionalist, interpretive, radical humanist, and radical structuralist. The four paradigms are founded upon different assumptions about the nature of social science and the nature of society. Theories are an essential part of the framework used to organize specific social phenomena within social science. Sciences. This lesson introduces the social four major theoretical perspectives in sociology, including structural, functional, social conflict, feminism, and social interactionism. Now, the other scholar for us who comes after Thomas Kuhn is Karl Popper, 1902 to 1992. Karl Popper, in full sir Karl Raymond Popper. He was born in Austria and later migrated to England, Austrian-born British philosopher of natural and social science who subscribed to an anti-determinist metaphysics, believing that knowledge evolves from the experience of the mind. His very famous book for us is Conjectures and Refutations, The Growth of Scientific Knowledge. Science must begin with myths, and within the criticism of myths, neither with the collection of observations, nor with the invention of experiments, but with the critical discussion of myths and of magical techniques and practices. The scientific tradition is distinguished from the pre-scientific traditions in having two layers. Like the latter, it passes on its theories, but it also passes on a critical attitude towards them. The theories are passed on not as dogmas, but rather with the challenge to discuss them and to improve upon them. Knowledge three worlds. Knowledge for Popper was objective, both in the sense that it is objectively true or truth-like, and also in the sense that knowledge has an ontological status, that is knowledge as object, independent of the knowing subject. He proposed three worlds, world one being the physical world or physical states, world two being the world of the mind or mental states, ideas and perceptions, and world three being the body of human knowledge expressed in manifold forms or the products of the second world made manifest in the materials of the first world, books, papers, paintings, symphonies, and all the products of the human mind. World three, he argued, was the product of the individual human beings. In exactly the same sense that an animal's path is the product of individual animals and thus has an existence and is evolution independent of an individually known subjects. The influence of world three in his view on individual human mind is at least as strong as the influence of world one. In other words, the knowledge held by a given individual mind owes at least as much to the total accumulated wealth of human knowledge made manifest comparable to the world of direct experience. As such, the growth of human knowledge would be said to be a function of the independent evolution of world three. Many contemporary philosophers such as Daniel Dennett have not embraced Popper's three world conjecture, mostly due to its resemblance to mind-body dualism. The falsification principle a proposed by Karl Popper is a way of demarcating science from non-science. It suggests that for a theory to be considered scientific, it must be able to be tested to and proven false. For example, the hypothesis that all swans are white can be falsified by observing a black swan. In particular, Popper argues that a scientific theory can be legitimately saved 
from falsification by the principle uh, of uh, uh, by the introduction of an auxiliary hypothesis that allows the generation of new falsible predictions. Criterion for of falsibility. Uh, in the philosophy of science, a standard of evolution of putatively scientific theories according to which a theory is genuinely scientific only if it is possible in principle to establish that it is false. For Popper's contribution uh, considered historicism to be the theory that history develops inexorably and necessarily according to knowledge, general laws towards determinate end. He argued that this view is the principal theoretical presupposition underpinning most forms of authoritarianism and totalitarianism. His book, The Open Society and Its Enemies, is a work on political philosophy by the philosopher Karl Popper, in which the author presents a defense of the open society against its enemies and offers a critique of theories of theological historicism according to which history unfolds inexorably according to universal laws. Open Society and Its Enemies, a very important book for students of political science, in political discourse, he is known for his vigorous defense of liberal democracy and the principles of social criticism that he believed made a flourishing open society possible. His political philosophy embraced ideas from major democratic political ideologies, including socialism, social democracy, libertarianism, classical liberalism and conservatism, and attempted to reconcile them. The criteria for good theory, then what is the criteria for good theory? First, coherence. The theory should be consistent, that is, free of internal contradictions. Second, clarity of exposition. The theory should be formulated in a clear and lucid manner. The unbiased, the theory should be based on purely, sub not should not, uh, be based on purely subjective valuations. No theory is value-free, but the theory should strive to be candid about its normative premises and values. Scope. The theory should be relevant to a large number of important issues. A theory with limited scope, for example, a theory about Indian decision-making during the 1962 no indian war. A theory with wide scope is a theory about foreign policy decision. Depth. The theory should be able to explain and understand as much as possible of the phenomenon that it purports to tackle. For example, a theory of European integration has limited depth if it explains only some part of that process and much more depth if it explains most of it. Evolution. IR thinking has evolved in stages that has marked by specific debates between groups of scholars. We saw that. The first major debate, we went through that. What were the three things and the emerging debates that are taking place? The first major debate uh, was won by the realists. During the Cold War, realism became the dominant way of thinking about international relations, not only among scholars, but also among politicians, diplomats, and so-called ordinary people. Morgan Taub, 1960, summary of realism became the standard introduction to IR in the 1950s and 60s. Realism seeks to study the struggle for power among nations in which every nation tries to ma uh, maintain or increase its power on the basis of its national self-interest. This approach to subject matter it stands on political standards for political actions and subordinates all other standards to political standards. That is the autonomy of the political. This is Hans Morgenthau, who is seen as the uh, uh, reviver of, of uh, realism. And he belongs to a tradition of realism in international relations theory. And he is usually considered, along with George F. Kennan and Reynold Nibur, as one of the three leading American realists of the post-Cold War II period. 
Uh, Morgenthau made landmark contributions and his most well-known book, which also I as a student at Presidency College Madras studied was Politics Among Nations. And if you have time, please read it. It's a wonderful book. The second major debate is about method. The contenders are traditionalists and the scientific school or the behavioralists. The former try to understand the complicated social world, human affairs and values fundamental to it, such as freedom, order and justice. The latter approach, behavioralism, finds no place for morality or ethics in international relations theory. Behavioralism wants to classify, measure and explain through the formulation of general laws like those formulated in the hard sciences. The behavioralists seem to triumph for a time, but in the end, neither side won the debate. Today, both types of methods are used in the discipline. There was a revival of traditional normative approaches to IR after the end of the Cold War. So you had the post-behavioralism where again David Easton was seen as the person who brought in this approach between the fact-value fact dichotomy. The second major in the uh, debate uh, or even the third, uh, what to say, uh, in the 1960s and 70s, neoliberalism challenged realism by arguing that interdependence, integration and democracy are changing IR. Neorealism responded that anarchy and the balance of power are still at the heart of IR. So international society theorists maintain that IR contains both realists of elements of conflict and the liberal elements of cooperation and that these elements cannot be collapsed into a single theoretical synthesis. They also emphasize human rights and other cosmopolitan features of world politics and they defend the traditional approach. The third debate is characterized by the neo-Marxist attack on established positions of realism, neorealism, liberalism and neoliberalism. But this debate concerns international political economy. It creates a more complex situation in the discipline because it expands the terrain towards economic issues and because it introduces the distinct problems of developing countries. This is one of the time where international relations scholars are told very clearly like people like Susan Strange and others that economists have to know politics and politician, polit political scientists have to know economics. You cannot separate the two because for where there is money, there is power and where there is power, there is money. This is what we see today in reality. There is no clear winner of the third debate within IPE. The discussion between the main contenders does still continue. The fourth debate, currently a fourth debate is underway in IR. It involves an attack on the established traditions by alternate approaches sometimes identified as post-positivist alternatives. The debate raises both methodological issues, that is how to approach the study of an issue, and sub substantive issues as well, that is which issues should be considered as the most important ones. Some of these approaches also reject the scientific claims of neorealism and neoliberalism. So if you see very clearly, international relations as an academic subject is, at, is constantly growing, both in width, depth, as well as in the way the discipline functions. So it is very important for us as students of international relations to understand that it is an interdisciplinary, dynamic, multidisciplinary subject. Thank you.